So it's top of the hour here, so I'm going to go ahead and kick off and go with uh, this session. This is the title of this session is Threat Modeling, Uncover Vulnerabilities Without Looking at Code. And so my name is Chris Romeo, and uh, I am from Raleigh, North Carolina, and I am the CEO and co-founder of a company called Security Journey. We focus on how do we teach developers about security in a, in a kind of a scalable way. Uh, I've been involved in security for 20 years at this point. I've done everything from director of incident response to trusted product evaluation to uh, working as part of a central security team at Cisco for, uh, t for five years. And um, so if application security is going to be one of the things that we focus on here, if you have any interest in, in learning more about that, I'm going to actually do a podcast called the Application Security Podcast. I uh, actually just interviewed somebody this morning from uh, the conference here. I'm going to interview somebody else this afternoon for a future episode. So I try to, we try to go out and connect with um, people that are doing interesting things in, in the world of application security. I also participate from the, uh, the, in the OWASP uh, world with a local chapter, kind of where I live. Um, and so threat modeling, I guess what kind of, uh, the, the reason that I can stand here and, and talk to you about threat modeling is I had the opportunity to build out Cisco's threat modeling practice within the 25,000 person engineering team there. And so a lot of my experience comes from understanding what threat modeling is, but also how can you use it in a way that it works with 25,000 people and a much bigger scale type of problem. And so, that, so that'll, that'll influence some of what I, uh, what I say today. So here's what I'm thinking about from an agenda. Here's what I want to want to cover and introduce you to. So um, we'll start by just talking about the what, why, and how of threat modeling. So when I say threat modeling, what do I mean? and um, why do we do it, and then I'm going to walk you through the approach that I teach developers how to do all the time. And throughout, as I walk through that process, I'll actually show you a sample threat model using the style that I, that I use, uh, so you can kind of see how, how it comes together in an actual threat model. I'll talk real quick towards the end about the available tools for threat modeling, and then we're going to, in capital letters with an exclamation point, we're actually going to threat model in here before we leave this session today. So um, I have this rule that when I talk about threat modeling or teach threat modeling, the maximum time I can talk is 30 minutes. After that, we actually have to threat model because I, feel, I truly believe there's not much more to say after 30 minutes that the, the next step is you actually have to dive in and do it. So at, towards the end here, at the 30 minute mark, I'm gonna bring up a something we can threat model. We'll split into a couple of groups here and just give you a chance to actually try this out and see how this process works with a very simple and very insecure solution or option. So when I say threat modeling, what, uh, what do I mean here? Well, I think of threat modeling as something that we can use to analyze the security of anything. Okay? It does not, this, is not a, this is not a concept that's specific to code or development or, or anything else. Threat modeling is something that after you become proficient at it, it becomes a bit of a curse. And I say that because then you begin to threat model everything that you experience. Okay, I have this experience all the time. In the United States, we have this, this uh, organization called the Transportation Security Administration. And they handle all of the security at the airports. And uh, they are not an elite force. I'll put it that way. I'm, I'm trying to be nice. This is being recorded. They are not who's going to be defending the borders if any, someone tried to invade. Okay? They're kind of a least common denominator. And so a bit of what they do is, is what we like to refer to as security theater. It's, you know, Bruce and I are co coined that term. Security theater is things look like people are doing things to make security better so that the general population will feel better. But in reality, what they're doing is really not improving security a whole bunch. And so I say all that to say that I can't, I can't walk through the TSA without threat modeling their whole process. Meaning I'm looking at what they're doing and I'm going, well, there's a problem there. Somebody could sneak something through there. Uh, look, there's, they've got these little ropes that are keeping people from walking on the backside, but everyone has their backs faced. They're, they're, everybody's looking in this direction. So somebody could actually sneak behind this whole group of people and get into the airport. And so, um, but, but bringing it back around to the world of development, threat modeling is taking a design, some, some idea that you have for a feature, and putting it under the security microscope. 
looking at how do we, how could we pick this apart? How could we break this on paper? And so when, you th when I think about developers specifically in threat modeling, so threat modeling is about analyzing a design. So it's about, it's about documenting what we're doing and then going through and considering what are the different challenges from a security perspective we could potentially have to deal with here. And it's also about mitigating vulnerabilities. So all the threat modeling in the world without that mitigating vulnerabilities is just a waste of time. So, and what I mean by mitigate vulnerabilities is when we start to threat model, we'll come up with a picture of what the feature is actually doing. We'll point out where the problems and the threats are. Mitigating vulnerabilities is where we go back and say, okay, we got to change this design. We are missing something here that needs to be adjusted. So threat modeling is, I, I, I like to call it basic application security hygiene. So this is like, from my perspective, this is like brushing your teeth. It's something you got to do early and you got to do often. And it's something you want to integrate into your development process. And I'm going to show you threat modeling from the way that I teach it as a process. But in the long run, I don't want threat modeling to be a process. I don't want it to require a series of steps and have a document that comes out of it at the end. I want threat modeling to be a habit so that when a developer starts to design something, all of a sudden in their head, they start picking it apart with what the potential problems are and they go, oh, we got to fix this. I couldn't do that. That's where you've reached like threat modeling nirvana is where you've had like, you have the developers and they're just, they're just seeing the threats right in front of them in their design. They're fixing them before they even have a chance for sec any security person to look over their shoulder and say, oh, did you think about this? So I think of this from a security feedback loop. Threat modeling is something that you're never actually complete with. You're never, there is no definition of done for threat modeling because the product, the feature, the subsystem, whatever it is you're working on, unless you freeze it in time and say we're never making another change to this, that's the only way you could say threat modeling is done. If, as long as you're continuing to change the code, change the design, add new features, you're going to have to constantly be going back and looking at the threat model to consider how does this, how is this impacted. So when I think of this security feedback loop, it's about identifying the threats first. So what are the challenges that we have to deal with? Changing the design or making those mitigations and then evaluating the mitigations to see, did we actually fix the problem? Or is the pro does the problem still exist? And I think of this as a feedback loop because we just, we're just gonna keep going around this circle forever, as long as we're developing the product until we end of life it. So why should you care then about threat modeling? as a developer? Why, why should you even think, oh, this is something that I should do? Well, what, what we've found over the last 20 years or so is that the more attention from an application security perspective that you place on the front end of your development process, the less security vulnerabilities that come out towards the end or after the product's been released. And that's just a simple function of investing time up front in proper security discipline and practice and finding those vulnerabilities in your design using threat modeling results in a lot less code that gets written with vulnerabilities built into it because you didn't see the design problem that existed. Um, so it also, one of the other things that we're going to do with threat modeling is it reduces what we call the attack surface. So the attack surface in general is any of the interfaces that exist coming into your feature could be a network port, could be a command line interface, could be, um, it just could be data coming from another process on the same system. All of those things are possible ways that an attacker could send an attack into your feature or what you're working on. And so one of the things we want to do in threat modeling is reduce that overall attack surface. And then the final part here is Threat modeling does help us to focus our security testing because we're already thinking about the design and the pieces that go into it so that we can, we can focus in and say, okay, we have this new feature. It has a couple of different things that we're building that are, that are, that are being added as a part of this feature. Threat modeling can help you to figure out what's the one we should spend the most time testing on. I mean, in a, in a crazy simple example, you know, a new web application there's a couple different functions. There's user registration. There is um, 
you know, displaying a, a, a RSS feed or a news feed or something, and then there's credit card processing. If I only can choose one of those three, I'm going to start looking very, testing very carefully at the credit card side. And if I can choose two, I'm going to add user registration. And only, I'm only going to look at the blog RSS feed portion if I have additional time there. So, so threat modeling can help us to do that prioritization. Okay, so I'm going to guess most of the programmers in the room here are C and C++. Is that, do we have any Java programmers? Okay, oh, we got a few, awesome. All right, let's play a game called Spot the Flaw. Okay, look at this piece of code here, and it has a problem. And so go ahead and take a look at it, and I'll give you about 15 seconds to analyze it. Find the problem in this code for me. I really need some theme music that plays at this point. Do you have theme music? No, sorry. Like a game show, you know, like we're waiting for something to happen. I can hum it, but it'll be embarrassing, so I'll hold off. All right, so anybody, what, what's the flaw that we see here in this? You should never represent money with a double. Okay. <laughs> All right. Many software strings are not checked, so. Okay, so there's no input validation happening here, okay? Yeah. What else? Okay, very weak typing is actually occurring. Okay. Anything else? Don't you have to mark things that can throw a throw and you can throw? Yeah, you probably should do something better from an exception processing perspective. Is that what you meant? Yeah. Okay. All of these things are correct. Public method. Okay, it's a public method. It could also be, be exposing. All of these things are correct. There's, there's no checking on anything. There's no checking on anything, yeah. A negative balance. Could be a negative balance, yes. All of these things are correct, but I'm going to step up to an even higher level and say, where's the, wh there's no authentication that's occurring in this, right? I mean, that's, that's, there are a number of secure coding flaws if we get down into the individual code. But if we step back and look at this as a bigger system, there's, where's the authentication that's happening? It doesn't exist here. All of that to say, how would we find that problem? If we were going to use kind of traditional application security approaches. So everybody probably knows static analysis security test or static uh, application security testing tools that, that you run against your source code to find problems. Running SaaS tools against this snippet of code will find almost everything that you guys, that everybody, that the audience here threw out. The strings problem, the public method, um, the potential for, you know, uh, you know, all, all the different language specific things. What it won't find is it won't, the, the static analysis tool is not going to tell you there's no authentication being done here. Because that's a higher order processing thing. And static analysis tools are just grinding out on the code looking for patterns and things. <coughs> they, they, it doesn't know. It, it's, there's no AI until somebody's going to now come up with some new company, static analysis AI or something, where they'll, they're going to think through the design of your entire system and tell you you're missing these things. But for now, you need a human being to see that there's no authentication here. So you, know, you could look at this from you know, static analysis in a dynamic application security testing perspective, but it's not going to, it's not going to point, pinpoint that there's no authentication. You could do a code review in this process, and perhaps you could detect this, that in a code review. Um, you could find it in the pen testing process. That's going to be the most expensive way to find it along the way. Um, um, and then also you could just have blind luck, perhaps. You know, who knows, maybe you'll just get lucky and you'll, you'll be able to, 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 somebody will accidentally find the problem. So when I think of threat modeling, I still, I still think of secure development lifecycle, or I still visualize secure development lifecycle from a waterfall kind of perspective, even though secure development lifecycle is layered on top of agile, it's layered on top of DevOps, doesn't matter what you're doing, you can take these same pieces and layer it in whatever your methodology is. But if we think about where these, where these challenge, where this issue is going to be found, um, pen testing is going to find this missing authentication after, usually after release. Very seldom do people do pen testing prior to some milestone in their software development process. It's not something you're doing every day because you can't afford it. 
Um, code review and SAST and DAS scanning, that's happening during the development and test kind of phases here. And I know in, in faster moving methodologies, develop and test are the same. They're, they're happening simultaneously and, and I get that. But it's still, yeah. What's SAST and DAS? SAST is static application security testing. So this is a, a suite of tools that are, that are um, pattern matching, looking at pieces of code. Um, DAST is dynamic application security testing. So that's your scanning. It's, it's more like a vulnerability scanner for apps is what DAST is doing. So um, one's looking at code, one's looking at the running, the running app, and they both have the same goal of identifying vulnerabilities. Um, but then threat modeling. So threat modeling is something that we're going to do further up in the process here. And so coming back to that, why is it going to be cheaper? It's always going to be cheaper to find problems here than find problems here. And there's, st there's studies that prove that. And, and, but just common sense tells me this is going to be less expensive than here because here I may have already sent it to customers. And if I have to send them a new version, sometimes they get angry if I do that often and all the other good stuff. So. What is this? What does this kind of cost? Well, you know, from a, a SAST and DAS perspective, it doesn't really matter because they're not going to find our missing authentication problem. Code review? I don't know. Would you find that missing authentication in an hour of code review? Maybe. Would you find it in ten, a hundred? I don't know. But it, it could be expensive to find it. Um, pen testing eighty three thousand um, is you know about the average that you pay an outside commercial company to come in and do a pen test of of some application. Um, that's just the way it is. But then when I think of threat modeling, I think you can find that same problem pretty easily in eight hours or less doing threat modeling. And so my, my takeaway for you here is what we're going to describe for the rest of our time is less expensive than paying all these other things to, to be able to find it. So yeah. But, but isn't the, the sort of the, the, the bug that you highlight or the, the missing authentication, isn't that sort of on a too granular level to be sort of exposed in? No, 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 no. It's going to be it, it's going to be one of the things that's going to that's going to jump to the front of the stage. Yeah, no, because I think like it would be it's, it's sort of sort of seen like an implementation like an implementation bug. Like a yeah, no, and I'll, I'll show you. We're going to go through an example here where we're going to we're going to extend we're going to reverse engineer that code snippet and go backwards and look at it in the threat modeling process to see how we would see have have pinpointed a missing authentication problem. Um, so let's see. So who in the room here is an expert in threat modeling? Who, who I should say, who in here is proficient at threat modeling? I do it. You do, okay. <laughs> My, I'm going to make an argument here to you that everybody in this room right now is already proficient at threat modeling. Okay. So stay with me here. Imagine this situation where you, you, you open the front door and to your house, you step outside and you've got you know, your, one of your children with you or you know, a niece or nephew or whatever, you gotta walk them to school. Okay, so you open the front door, you're standing on the front steps and you're preparing to kind of walk down the steps and go off. There's a road in front of your house. Cars are going by at a you know, pretty, pretty fast rate of speed. Okay, so you, you hear that, you look up, you see the cars coming really fast. You're thinking, I have a small child with me, I have to protect them here. You hear a dog barking down the street, just making, I wish I had a barking sound effect, I don't. Um, the, the sun's beating down, it's very bright. It's a very, it's a very hot day and the sun is, is very well exposed here. So from a threat modeling perspective, you're threat modeling as soon as you open the door and you reach down and take that child's hand, you, the cars are flying by, threat, right? If I let go of the child's hand as I'm walking on the sidewalk, they could run out in the street and get hit by the car. Threat. I just did. I just threat. I just identified the threat. I'm hearing the dog barking down the street. I know we got to walk that way. That's a threat. Maybe if the dog's loose and running around, I've got a small child with me. I got to protect him. That's another threat. The sun's beating down on, on us. Did we put sunscreen on the child? Are they going to get sunburned while we're walking to the school? So my point is, we all threat model all the time, but we don't. We don't force it. We don't focus it back on our development. You know, we don't apply it at work, but threat modeling is something we do naturally as human beings. We're always trying to figure out what are the challenges that, that we are, are faced with. And a lot of times, you know, in this example, all of that's happening, you're not even thinking about, oh, I'm doing a threat model here. There's a threat, and what's the mitigation for the dog? And, you know, but in your brain, you're doing it because you want to protect the child. And so threat modeling is just extending this idea 
that we already know how to do into the world of tech. So a um, couple of questions that, uh, that uh, somebody who's pretty famous in the world of threat modeling, a guy named Adam Shostak, who used to be at Microsoft and built up their program there. Uh, he's been doing some work in the uh, OWASP, the Open Web Application Security Project, which is an open source group of people that build out all kinds of uh, deliverables and things and, and open source them for, uh, for security. And so he's kind of come up with this approach, approach that he's used for the last few years. And, and I put it in here because I, I think it's an even simpler way than what I'm going to show you. So I just want you to be aware that if, if what I show you, you're like, oh, it's a little too in-depth, you can step back to this version that Adam provides. And, and so he asks these four questions. So when he sits down with a developer across the table from him, he says, okay, what are you building? And then he sits there and listens while they explain, okay, I'm doing this and that. And then he starts to take them through a process where, we, where he says, okay, so what can go wrong? What could break in this, whatever, whatever scope is that we're looking at? What could break? What could happen? What could be the results? And then comes back with, what are we going to do about it? What can you change to take away the, the things that you said were going to break? And then there's always the retrospective question of, did we do a good enough job? So you get to the end, you look at everything that you did, and you say, did we do, do a good enough job? What I'm going to show you, kind of the process approach that I take, is similar to that, but you can always come back to those questions. I put a link in the bottom of the slides when they're available later. Um, that's to the OWASP site where that project actually lives. There's a whole project on application threat modeling that the OWASP folks are, are, are working on. So when I think of threat modeling, I break it down into five steps. And like I said, I don't want this to be the process that you follow forever. I want you to, to ingrain and make this process operate inside your brain so you don't need this picture anymore. And so the first thing is we look at what is the scope that we're doing a threat model of. We draw a picture. We analyze that picture to identify the threats. We then decide how are we going to mitigate or make those threats go away. And then we got to document it in some way. So when we think about threat modeling, threat modeling is not an exact science. Okay, there is no equation. We can't write, a, we can't write a, a function that takes some amount of input and spits out all the threats that go into it because it's, there's a subjective nature to this because it's human beings that are looking at a particular design and that, that what threats they identify are going to be couched by their experiences, their background, things that they've seen other people do before. And so I just want you to know it's not an exact science. And the other thing is, when I think of threat modeling, I have to remind myself all the time that perfect in this case really is the enemy of good, meaning trying to take a threat model to the point where it's perfect is just going to drive you insane because they're, they're, you're never going to get to done with the threat model, like I said. And so you know, getting to something ha is a measurable approach in threat modeling. Getting to perfection, you're never going to get there. So, so just know that going in that it's a work in progress and it's always going to be a work in progress as you go. So when I think about um, threat modeling, I start with the scope. So we have to figure out how, what are we going to threat model first? Are we going to look at an individual feature or module, which is where I recommend if you're getting started with threat modeling, you want to pick a small piece to look at. Because when you start to get into you know, looking at the subsystem or service level or, or even the entire product, it's such a massive amount of interfaces and there's so many moving pieces that you can quickly get lost in, in there's so much detail I can't do anything with this. And that's why I recommend, at least in the beginning, and, and I even still try, I've been doing this for years now, I still try to focus in on how can we threat model this feature alone as a separate entity. And so that's, that's kind of what I recommend there. The other thing you're thinking about in scope is you're thinking about who are the different entities that are trying to attack this feature, this subsystem, this entire product. We're thinking about the user perspective, because users can do bad stuff to our systems and our features anyway. Um, we're talking about the admin, and then we're also thinking about the attacker in general. What, what would the attacker be able to potentially do? So then I like to very early on, I like to figure out what is the attack surface for whatever it is that we're scoping to do the threat model of. And when I think of the attack surface, this is, you know, I'm asking myself these types of questions. Does it accept network packets? Does it perform administration? Is there a CLI? Is it, is it doing something that allows me to configure the system? Is it running as a daemon? Is it a web interface? Or is it speaking network protocols? All of these things are interfaces. A network protocol is an interface because it's defined by an RFC. There's a series of usually commands and data structures and things. Those are all interfaces. As an attacker, I can send attacks embedded in the protocol that go inbound to your feature. 
And so that you have to think of what are all the different attack surfaces that are out there we could potentially be dealing with. So then the next, the next step here is we need to draw a picture. And that picture is going to include a couple of different things. So one thing is it's going to have a process. And so process is the first, um, describes some type of work that's actually being done on the system. We're using, so, so the approach that I take here, we're using data flow diagrams, which none of us have used since university. Like once you graduate, you never have to use a DFD again, I don't think. Um, but this is a very simple set of DFD things. And I, for me, it just works. I like to be able to sketch a picture that has a little bit of structure to it about how, what a feature does. So then we have data stores. Could, that, these could be files, could be databases, anything where that's storing information. Could be memory even if you wanted to. One of the most important things when we're drawing this picture is we have to identify where the trust boundary is. And the trust boundary is the separation between evil outside world and semi-trusted inside the feature. I say semi-trusted because I don't ever trust anything 100%. But when we're thinking about this, how is our feature having input interact with it you know, from, from you know, whatever sending, whatever's sending something inbound? So where, this is where the evil attackers are going to live, is out, outside the trust boundary. The really important thing about the trust boundary is when we're going through and doing our threat modeling and our analysis, we, I always focus on that trust. Anything that crosses this trust boundary via a, um, via a data flow, this is always where I spend the, the majority of my time. I don't really care that much about things that are moving inside the system. I'm going to look at them and assess them and, and see if there's anything to be found. But I'm most interested when a data flow crosses from the untrusted outside internet public world to the inside of whatever I have. And so then we also have external entities. We use those to map things like attackers, browsers, things that are outside of the control of our system but yet we still want to be thinking about them for the purposes of the picture. The nice thing is when we're dealing with external entities, we never consider threats to the external entity because we don't care. It's outside of our trust boundary. It's outside of our control. Even if we do care, there's nothing we can do because you can't control an end user's browser that's a customer of yours. I mean, you can try, but good luck. So here's an example of, of what I call attributes. And so, the way I, I like to make these data flow diagrams more useful is I define attributes in two different phases. So there's functional attributes, and a functional attribute just defines what is the thing doing. And when I draw, when I do this type of modeling on a whiteboard, I mean, I'll, I'll do these, this, these type of notes right embedded into the picture. Because the picture is for me to think through how the system works. It's not a, something I'm going to put on display in a museum or anything, or you know, for, it's not a piece of art. Um, and then also there's, there's another attribute of data. So what is the data that's actually being passed here? And so from a functional perspective, when I look at this data flow right here, functionally it's a protocol and um, it's, it's Telnet. The data is a username and password that's being sent back and forth across that connection. And so this just helps me to, to keep all the, the facts in front of me that I'm trying to consider in the process. So here's an example of a data flow diagram for that previous little snippet of code that I wrote from a Java perspective. And so the fact that it's missing authentication kind of makes me draw the trust boundary and actually push the um, collection of that information outside of, of my uh, overall trust boundary. And so because there's no authentication, there really isn't, you know, you could even argue that there's a limited trust boundary at that point if there's no authentication that's actually being performed. But we'll come back to that example here in a minute. And I'm almost at my 30 minute mark, so I gotta speed up here so we can start threat modeling. When we analyze our threats, we use a, a simple way of doing it is what's called stride, okay? Microsoft came up with this. I've tried, I started, learned how to threat model using stride. I tried to run away from it and it drew me back in because it's simple. You don't have to, well, especially when you have developers who don't have security backgrounds, you can explain, okay, here's the different classifications of threats that we want to think about. Spoofing, this is trying to be somebody who, who you're not. Um, tampering, this is modifying or changing the data on the, uh, as it's being sent between two points. Repediation, everybody Simpson fans? 
The Simpsons, yeah, maybe a little bit. I mean, Bart Simpson always says, I didn't do it, nobody saw me do it, can't prove anything. That's how I define repudiation. Like, it's, that's what repudiation is. It's, it's saying, I didn't, <laughs> I didn't do it and you can't prove it. Um, information disclosure, leaking some information that should be private out of, a, out of a service. Denial of service, we all know what that means. Elevation of privilege, going from a lower level, you know, someplace where I'm a normal user, can I somehow increase my privilege to be an administrator through some way? So stride is what we're going to use as the foundation of kind of how we think through um, these individual uh, kind of approaches and pictures and stuff. So um, from a mitigation perspective, each of these stride categories has a compensating control. So if, you're, if spoofing is the problem, we need better authentication, strong authentication. If tampering is, ha is, is, your, is the concern we come up with, we better have something that's doing um, comp protecting confidentiality and encrypting the data between two points. Um, repudiation, I mean, strong authentication and authorization can help with repudiation. Um, we're getting into digital signatures and, and let's sign things to prove that people, that, that somebody actually did something because they provided something that only they have. Information disclosure, encryption can help, better AppSec can help, you know, resilience and then uh, better authorization. So there's, the, the point is it's there, there's things that help us to kind of protect these, uh, to, to provide these mitigations, um, there's, there's compensating controls that we can apply here. Um, I'm going to come back to, the, to an example here in a second, so I want to get to doing some threat modeling. Um, final step I have in my process here is the documentation step. So with the documentation step, we, we just, the point here is when you do threat modeling, you've got to capture the results that come out of it somewhere. It may be that you're using JIRA and that's where you're tracking all your issues. And so if that's the case, I would say then use JIRA. Don't do something different just to do threat modeling. To make threat modeling work at scale, you have to, you have to use the existing tools that you have and plug into them. It could be as simple as putting your results in a text file. It could be storing them as GitHub issues, whatever, you know, whatever your, your process calls for. Okay, so Real quick before we start threat modeling, a couple of different approaches that you have from a technology perspective to actually do threat modeling, but I still think, I always come back to this one. If I can get in a room with the people that I'm trying to teach developer, the developers I'm trying to teach, I don't care about any of this other stuff. I'll, I'd rather be at a whiteboard, and what I usually do is I walk in and I say, um, draw me a picture of what you're working on right now. And they start to draw that picture, and then I just start to ask questions. Well, what about this? What if somebody did this? What would happen in that feature? And sometimes I know the answer to the question. Sometimes I don't. Sometimes I just throw out random questions to see how the system works and try and learn more from that perspective. But I think that the, the whiteboard is always the whiteboard or the napkin. You know, if napkin, if you're in a bar or something, you don't have access to a good whiteboard, you can always use a little napkin for, for threat modeling as well. Microsoft has a free tool. Um, if you don't, if you you know, if you're okay with using something from the Microsoft universe as part of your process, um, it's if you've ever used Visio, it's like a version of Visio that does threat modeling, but it's it's decent. Um, we used it at Cisco for a while, uh, and and they've they've really made it available so you can run it on any. They used to have weird licensing requirements for it, but they, they now they've made it a standalone application. So it's it's decent. It's worth taking a look. It allows you to take this process that I just described for you and automate not automate it, but automate the collection of the data points along the way. OWASP Threat Dragon is a brand new web-based project that is building a threat modeling solution that runs you know as an application. Um, the, only con the only concern I have recommending that right now, I love it, I think it's a great tool and a great project, but it's an, it's an alpha project right now. I mean, it's, there, there's just, it's got, it's got some problems. You, can, you could use it if you wanted to, but it needs to get to that beta stage to really be useful. Another one is a, a friend of mine has a product called Arius Risk, which um, is just a, it allows you to do threat modeling with bigger p groups of people and stuff. And so I just throw that in there because, you know, I don't, I don't work for that company. I don't have anything to do with it. But um, it's one that, that I recommend that people I'm working with, if they say, hey, we're trying to do this at scale with 10,000 people, the Microsoft tool, the whiteboard for 10,000 people, the whiteboard is hard to, hard to pull off. The Microsoft Threat Modeling Tool and Threat Dragon are going to have similar scalability problems, like what do I do with the results, who's reviewing it, all of that. And so a tool you know, like Arius Risk is going to give you a better kind of workflow perspective. 
All right, so with that, does anybody here know the rules of Threat Modeling Club? Okay. The first rule of Threat Modeling Club is you do talk about Threat Modeling Club. And the second rule is you do talk about Threat Modeling Club and what should be the eighth rule, but I couldn't figure out how to make it work in PowerPoint without making it really long. If this is your first night at Threat Modeling Club, you have to Threat Model. So with that, I give you a data flow diagram. And what I want to do, I'm five minutes over my, my allotted time for talking about threat modeling. What I'd love to do here is have us kind of split into a couple of groups and look at this picture and start to think through, I, I put a copy of Stride up here for you, spoofing, tampering, repudiation, you know, all the different pieces. And yes, this is a horribly insecure example. Yes, I get that. That's on purpose because we have a very short amount of time to experience threat modeling and I don't want to give you something super hard that takes four hours to understand an architecture of. So I did this on purpose and made it super simple with a, with a lot of problems to be found. But what I'd love to do right now is have people kind of, let's split up into, um, let's kind of gather in a couple of different groups here real quick and just kind of throw out some ideas that you see and um, we'll kind of do a little uh, rundown at the end. So. Does that work? Can we do that? Mm -hmm. All right, let's go ahead and do that. We got about nine minutes left. So at about the two minute mark to go, I'm going to come back and ask you for at least one threat that came out of your little pod of people as far as uh, one that you want to throw out to the, the world here. And I'm just going to come around and listen as people are talking. So let's, let's, uh, let's go ahead and, and do that now, please. Oh, the MDUP protocol? It stands for made up. <laughs> it's made up, yeah. I made it up last night and I thought it was clever at about, you know, 10 o'clock at night it was really clever. <sighs> Almost zero availability. <laughs> <laughs> this will be where you'll have to put the interlude in on the recording. Like an, you have to have like an interlude music or something, you know, or you can speed it up, you know, where. Yeah, but we've only got like five minutes for an example, so I could have given you an example that would have taken four hours to to dig through, but. So, um, I mean, the attacker can just log in, right? I mean, there's no, there's no nothing anywhere. Is that, is that I, mean, yeah, I, I guess the attacker can, he can just uh, <laughs> use the admin interface, uh, but he can also uh, just uh, hook directly into the config daemon. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, so uh, right, the reach yeah. is uh, for in yeah, yeah, yeah. two directions. Uh, or maybe just go directly to the database. Yeah. So as you're thinking threats, as you're thinking through the threats, think about it in the context of an, an attacker or somebody could do something almost like a user story. It's, it's similar to a user story. You know, an attacker could do this. But then also, what's the mitigation to that? 
yes, this is a horribly architected solution that's, that has 100 problems. But part of threat modeling is what's the answer? How do you fix it? So when you, when you call out something, also then continue and say, OK, it's, it, it, as an attacker, I'd be able to do this. What's the, and then talk about what the answer is. How do you fix that in this picture? And you can keep it simple. <laughs> that's a good one, actually. That's a, that's a legitimate threat right there. But like, like people always, you know, trying to be clever. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, there are things that establish yeah. protocols that have been. Mm-hmm. That, 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 so that Happens with crypto, too. Uh -huh. With crypto as well. People think, oh, I can write an algorithm. It's not that hard. And then I won't tell anybody, so they won't be able to figure it out. <laughs> Which always works well for nobody. Why are you even exposing an admin interface? Because this is a horribly uh, insecure example. Yeah. So, uh, so I do architecture, and I'm, you know, I said 27,001 and the rest of this kind of like, yeah. stop doing that. No, I've just been on a phone call going, we're not doing that. We're doing yeah. That. <laughs> but I'm looking at a picture. Cursive. No, it's, the idea is, um, I got about five minutes with this audience yeah, for sure. them to experience threat modeling. And if I make it, if I give a, a kind of a medium level difficulty, yeah. people yeah, just yeah, yeah, stand sure. there and be like, I don't see anything. I don't know. We're talking about um, external entity threats, and I'm going, duress? Then, uh, yeah. I've <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, got 100 lines in my split threat model for one particular system. Oh, okay. Yeah. So it's full of, you know, real risk model, but, that, but that's the, uh, the whole architectural yeah. level of, of call center and people trying to uh, ring up. Yeah. So that's all yeah, see, that's, on see, I, offline as well. I tend to play in the, what I'll call the threat modeling space, and when you start talking about the risk modeling, like you're getting, and by duress, I'm assuming you mean like, the system admin, admin has a gun to the back of their head. Yeah, or, or a user. Or a user, yeah, yeah. So, I mean. And, and you then get users using things incorrectly, Machia, whether it's Machiavelli or Murphy. And it can be those two, which is, yeah. you go like, okay, how do I know? Is yeah, somebody so, doing this thing by mistake or are they? Yeah, so I would, I would say I consider some of that, but the duress one from the, the trying to get developers to do this, no. like risk and risk modeling is more about, you're thinking about, that threat, whereas they have to think about kind of the average user, yeah. the average attacker and stuff. But yeah, I think it's, I just like to watch the light bulb come on. Yeah, yeah, for it's people. fine. And they try not storing the data in the first place. Yeah, that's always a good. Uh, <laughs> it really works. You ain't got it, you can't lose it. That's why, uh, that's why I use Stripe for my all my credit card processing yeah. because they handle, I don't, I don't store any, there's no credit card data anywhere near. No, you don't. They enter it in my site, and then it gets sent right to Stripe. I never get to see it. They handle no, all do, of it. You don't do PCI DSS. Don't go there. No. There's no Token reason base. to. I, yeah. I've got to be careful. I'm being recorded. I'll be like, they'll be like, the PCI DSS people track me down. Why are you not recommending what we do? Because it's ancient. <laughs> would, would you like me to give you a list of reasons? I got a client right now that um, they uh, are, are, I did some training for them. And they're looking at the list and they're saying, okay, well, the PCI DSS says we have to have things like cross-site request forgery, which OWASP Top 10 just dropped it for 2017 because it's, it's an issue as an industry. We've kind of got it under control now. It's built in the frameworks. It's pr really hard to have a new web application with CSRF. The PCI DSS people, still in there. Then people have to be trained on it. 
Hmm? And it's like, that's just... I, I have a recent year client had to report themselves to the ICO in the UK um, because they found that somebody was attacking with known username, known credential, uh, good credentials, and the known postcode. Hmm. They stopped them doing this one, but they basically reported themselves to the ICO. The ICO said, not your fault. Mm -hmm. Thanks for reporting it. And yeah. But, um, oh, yeah. It was existing credentials. I got to close this yeah. session out. Okay, so... You know, as you're, and, and I'm, I've been able to overhear a little bit of kind of what's the conversation that's been going on, and all I'm trying to do here is, is just get you to experience this for just a couple of minutes. This is what threat modeling looks like when you do it as a developer. You get together with a couple other people, you draw a picture of a feature you're working on, and part of the magic in this process is having multiple people working on it at the same time. It's very difficult to threat model by yourself and just looking at it, and, and because you kind of get you get stuck on your perspective. And so when you get a group of people working together, somebody else will say something and then you'll, you'll springboard off that idea and it'll trigger something in your brain to go, oh yeah. And then you can take it further and continue to, to develop it. So um, let me kind of land the plane here just so we're, just cause we're out of time and then we can keep talking, I'll keep talking about threat modeling. Um, so when I think about this, you know, I talked about threat modeling, it's about analyzing security of everything that we're doing. Um, it's about preventing bugs later in the release process. I showed you that simple process for how we can apply it, you know, scope, draw, analyze, mitigate, and document. I try to, try to keep that as simple as possible. That's my desire. Just I want to make this easy so people can jump in and do it. Talked about a couple of the tools that are available out there. And really, the, the big takeaway is the best way to get good at threat modeling is to threat model. Just that is what it is. Like it's not, it's something I could teach you an eight hour class and if all I did was lecture, you would not get anything more out of it than what we just talked about here. Because there's only so much talk and then it comes down to drawing pictures and getting in there and actually working on the threat models themselves. So uh, with that, there's my contact information. If you ever want to continue to talk about threat modeling or anything else, just uh, let me know. And it's been a pleasure to be here with you today. And thank you for participating in this uh, little exercise. I'm going to take, if anybody has questions, I'm going to take them off mic. Yeah, sure. Sure. Do you want to re keep recording that? Okay. Um, yeah. So, did you have a different question? Okay. Uh, is it a quick one? Okay. So the challenge though, the challenge with that is people get lost, you get lost when you start trying to document the entire system and it's your and you're brand new to threat modeling. So what happens is you end up with this diagram and it's got so much complexity and then you add more to, to the point where you have a diagram that looks like this except there's hundreds of, of processes on it and there's hundreds of data stores and all of a sudden you're looking at it going, what am I, I can't do anything with this. Okay. So maybe a smaller system would be, would be well, every system though can very easily reach hundreds of processes and things. And I don't mean just Unix processes. This, this, is, this is just some, some unit of work being done by some component in the system. And so that's why I recommend start small only because when you look at a single feature, you're not going to get, it's not going to be as, as difficult. You're not going to get lost in the, the complexity of it. So. Um, yeah, so if we just kind of walk through this, doc, this diagram, the approach I always take is I use this stride methodology and I just systematically go through and consider each one. So I'm going to start with spoofing and say, okay, we looked at um, the, the, the made up protocol, both of the input and output version. We talked about it has zero um, confidentiality and, and zero integrity protection. So that tells me right away I've got a spoofing problem. That there, there's a, a thread of spoofing that exists throughout this entire architecture, um, depending on what's going on on the back end, I may have a spoofing problem there as well. Tampering is going to be another threat. Somebody, an attacker could change 
some, uh, some of these requests, if, like we said, there's no confidentiality on these connections, then they could actually, an attacker could do a man in the middle attack where they intercept the traffic, make some changes to it, and then send it back through because there's nothing protecting that data along the way. Um, repudiation, as I scan through and look at this, um, I mean, I didn't draw an admin onto this, but w repudiation, the, the threat that somebody makes a change on this system through the configuration process, say if we had an admin, you know, say we drew an admin over here who was part of this, and we showed them connecting to the configuration daemon, I would ask the developers the question, so how do you know that person actually made the change that they said they, that, that you think they did. How can you prove it? So if they wiped out the entire fleet of router configurations, how do you know who that was? And so that's, that's one, it's a threat, but it's gonna take more questioning to get to, the, to how does the system um, do it. Um, information disclosure, I mean, so we have, to, we have to talk in more depth about what, what's actually exposed here at this interface. Is there a daemon that's providing some amount of information? Um, I didn't say whether there was authentication here. I left it up to you to decide in your own little model in your mind if there was authentication happening. Um, same thing's happening here on the back side. We have to think about, we have to ask the question, what's occurring at this daemon? What is, what is this thing giving off? What information is it giving off without authentication? What's it giving off if we are authenticated? Uh, I look at this and I say, okay, this is a denial of service waiting to happen um, because there's nothing that says we have any type of protections that's going to prevent a denial of service condition from occurring in this platform. And then elevation of privilege, let's pretend we have, well, I mean, we have the config daemon, so there is a threat that an attacker, you know, we haven't really described whether this is public internet or whether this is some type of control network where we're, we're hidden inside the data center. Um, but so we have to consider the, the potential threat of elevation of privilege happening here. We have to ask the developer the question, well, how is authentication happening from this router to here or here to here? How do they know they're talking to each other? Um, is there a user account that has a privilege associated with it? And then is there a corresponding admin privilege level that goes with it that somebody could try to do something inside the daemon in how they interacted with it to try to raise their privilege? So, my process is always gonna fall back to stride as how I start. And then once we get through stride, if everything looks, if I can't find anything in stride, then I'm gonna pull back and say, okay, now let's start brainstorming new stuff that's outside of that methodology. But what I find is when I'm starting off with new projects and, and helping people threat model, there's so, much th there's so many things that get triggered in the stride alone that that takes them six months to fix the problems that we can find here. Um, and then after that, the next stage is to, if everything here is checked where we're like, we got all this stuff figured out, then we start looking at the diagram and saying, okay, how can we be creative from an attacker's perspective and take it to a whole other level of, um, you know, yeah, I mean, there's just, there's a, there, we, we, have to, we have to have more detail and we have to have the basics kind of figured out first before we continue on. So that, that's my take on, on, what it, uh, on, on what I see in that picture or what I was intending for you to see or hoping you to kind of, you saw some of those things along the way. So yeah, anybody have any questions? I know we're, is it lunchtime right now? Okay, I'm, I hate to stand in the way of anyone's lunch, so yeah, thank you.